Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Updates in Pediatrics live stream. Updates in Pediatrics is a monthly live stream program which takes place on the third Wednesday of the month at noon. Participants will receive a link following the program today for an evaluation. You can also use the QR code that will be displayed following the live stream today. The program will also be available online within two weeks at NortonCME.com. So today's speaker is Dr. Raj, who is the Division Chief of Pediatric Hematology Oncology and the Medical Director of Norton Children's Cancer Institute. He has been with us in Louisville for the last 21 years. And previously, he completed his undergraduate training in India and a pediatric residency at Stony Brook University in New York before doing a fellowship in pediatric hematology oncology at the NIH pediatric branch of the National Cancer Institute. His areas of interest include leukemias, sickle cell disease, and hemophilia and thrombosis. He has published over 50 peer-reviewed journal, journal articles in these areas, and he does have relevant relationships with Global Blood Therapeutics, Forma Therapeutics, and Terumo BCT Incorporated as a consultant. So I welcome Dr. Raj, who's gonna be talking to us today about identifying common blood disorders in pediatric patients. Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and to talk to you today. Um, in today's presentation, uh, you know, uh, since the topic is really a vast one, I thought I'll just focus on some of the common bleeding disorders today. And then, you know, on subsequent um, presentations, we can tackle, you know, other common uh, blood diseases we see in children. So these are my disclosures as uh, Mark, uh, Dr. McDonald alluded to. So first of all, let us uh, talk a little bit about uh, the common presentations we see in children with bleeding disorders. So uh, the common complaints can be, uh, for example, we could see a newborn with bleeding from the umbilical stump, or it could be um, a post-circumcision bleeding sometimes. Uh, it could be a male infant who is starting to walk and presents with a painful swollen joint after falling. Or it could be an otherwise healthy child with petechiae and easy bruising following a viral infection. Or it could be an adolescent female who is presenting with excessive menstrual bleeding. And many times we get uh, referrals from uh, ENT specialists, for example, for um, pre-surgical evaluation because they have done some COAG studies and found uh, elevated PTT, for instance. So, so these are the common presentations. Um, now let us uh, briefly look at um, the dis differences between uh, a primary hemostatic defect and a clotting factor deficiency. We'll uh, dwell into this a little bit more in subsequent slides. But uh, briefly, I want to say that some of the common presentations that we see, which include skin and mucous membrane bleeds, they, do, they typically denote a primary hemostatic defect. Uh, clotting factor deficiency, like the hemophilias, tend to present with more uh, soft tissue, muscle, or joint bleeds. Uh, bleeding after minor cuts, for example, is also a common presentation with a primary hemostatic uh, defect. Uh, petechiae, again, common in the primary hemostatic defect, as are uh, small superficial ecchymosis. But if you have large, deep, palpable bruises, that's usually indicative of a clotting factor deficiency. Hemarthrosis, as I mentioned, is rare in primary hemostatic defect, but is common in uh, clotting factor deficiencies. Uh, bleeding after trauma or surgery we tend to see immediate bleeding when you have a primary hemostatic defect, but you can have delayed bleeding in patients with uh, clotting factor deficiency. Um, you know, one of the common uh, reference that we get is um, delayed bleeding, uh, you know, after tonsillectomy. So we'll uh, discuss that uh, hopefully in the subsequent uh, presentation. Um, now, um, like I mentioned earlier, uh, so history of uh, post-circumcision bleeding, post tonsillectomy bleeding, these are important considerations. Now, a family history is, is generally very useful. Um, you know, generally um, 
uh, you get a family history of um, maternal relatives, especially uh, maternal uncles or um, you know um, or other um, maternal relatives who have uh, a history of hemophilia, both for hemophilia A and hemophilia B, because they have an X-linked inheritance. But keep in mind. 33%, that means one third of patients newly diagnosed with hemophilia can have a negative family history. Also, it's important to ask in the maternal history, um, any, uh, you know, menorrhagia is something typically we ask if mom or grandma or um, maternal aunt or siblings who are females um, have history of heavy menstrual bleeding. Another important aspect to consider is uh, postpartum hemorrhage particularly if there has been a need for transfusion. This uh, postpartum hemorrhage is uh, typically, generally classic for the most common bleeding disorder, which is von Willebrand disease, which we will talk in the subsequent slides. So also important to include in the history is uh, medications, you know, typically, you know, patients, if they have been on NSAIDs or anti-epileptic drugs and uh, accidental ingestions, then oftentimes, you know, we are um, having to evaluate a child for possibility of non-accidental trauma. And uh, we uh, initiate a bleeding disorder workup, which we try to be very comprehensive just to make sure there's no underlying explanation for um, uh, the bruising or the superficial bleeds we are seeing in the child. So this is an example of uh, some of the common presentations we see. The first picture on the left shows you some petechiae, and then the, the picture, the second picture, the one above shows brew uh, ecchymosis, and the picture below shows uh, mucosal bleeding. So these are some of the common presentations. So when you do a physical exam, we look for, uh, you know, it's very common in a toddler who's just learning to walk or starting to run around, bumping against furniture, to find small bruises on bony prominences in, in front of the body. And um, some, sometimes, you know, uh, parents um, you know, go to the primary care physician saying that, hey, this child has got lots of bruising on the lower extremities, but that's expected. Um, so uh, also sometimes you can see when uh, uh, babies begin to crawl that they can have bruises on their forehead, you know, as and I mentioned previously on the uh, knees and shins as well. In non-mobile infants, usually before nine months of age, significant bruising is unusual and often without the spectrum of normal bruising. So common sites for bruising at all ages include, uh, uncommon sites, excuse me, of, for bruising at all ages include back, buttocks, arm, and abdomen. So if you find bruising in all these areas, you know, think of pathologic causes or non-accidental trauma. Next one. So let me go over briefly the, an overview of coagulation. So hemostasis is the process of blood clot formation. When a blood vessel is disrupted, the hemostatic response must be quick, localized, and carefully regulated. So abnormal bleeding um, may occur when specific elements are missing or dysfunctional. So what are the various steps of primary hemostasis? So the first step is vasoconstriction. Then, you know, there is injury to subendothelium, which exposes the circulating blood to the subendothelial elements from which it would normally have been protected. And endothelial cell activation occurs subsequently, which promotes recruitment of platelets and other cell types. So first, what happens is a platelet adhesion. Basically, it's the interaction between the platelet and the exposed subendothelial collagen. The next step is platelet activation. So as the platelets uh, become adherent to the subendothelial collagen, they undergo a conformational change and release the intracellular contents. So this leads to um, platelet-platelet interaction, which we refer to as platelet aggregation. Now, when the platelets are activated, at the same time, there is exposure of procoagulant platelet phospholipids, particularly phosphatidyl serine. This leads to an assembly of clotting factors on the surface of the platelets. And this is what we refer to as a cell-based 
coagulation. So this is the classic coagulation cascade you're all familiar with. So, um, you know, what is important here is to recognize that the, for any procoagulant complex, it requires an enzyme, it requires a cofactor protein and the enzyme substrate. And um, all these um, are assembled on the surface of, on the cell, on the cell membrane, you know, on the phospholipid and the exposed source phospholipid surfaces in presence of calcium. So first what happens is tissue factor dependent activation occurs of factor seven. And factor 7A uh, is a protease and along with tissue factor, which now serves as a cofactor, factor uh, 10 being the substrate, we get what is called extrinsic 10As that converts 10 to 10A. It also converts factor 9 to 9A. Now there's also an intrinsic, ten, intrinsic 10As wherein factor 9A, um, which acts as a protease here, along with factor 8A as a cofactor and factor 10 as a substrate. This factor 9A can be generated either from the extrinsic 10As or by activation of the intrinsic pathway directly or by thrombin induced activation of factor 11. Now this ultimately leads to the formation of prothrombinase which consists of uh, factor 10A as a protease, factor 5A as a cofactor and factor two as a substrate. So the clotting factors have, rem have a remarkably specific, remarkable specificity for their substrates. For example, factor 9A activates factor 10, but it does not activate factor two. This need for proper structural alignment of the substrate to the enzyme this is very, very important that uh, they have to be aligned perfectly so that proteolytic cleavage occurs uh, subsequently. Now in this uh, chart, I've also included um, a von Willebrand factor, which is the carrier protein for factor eight. And uh, so that has got an important role also in um, uh, hemostasis. So while we have procoagulants on one side, we have inhibitors of coagulation on the other side. So you have a tissue factor um, protease inhibitor, then you have protein C, uh, and S, and then you have uh, uh, antithrombin-3. So, you know, uh, normally what happens is that there is a balance between uh, the procoagulants and anticoagulants. In the newborn, for example, both the procoagulants and anticoagulants are reduced. But so long as they're balanced, it doesn't, uh, you know, um, swing the balance into either uh, bleeding or thrombosis uh, type of presentation. But in a, in a sick newborn, everything is different. So either you can have a deficiency of clotting factor or abnormalities of the inhibitors of coagulation and that leads to either bleeding or clotting complications. So as you will see when I talk about hemophilia later on, you know, people are also looking at what is called rebalancing therapy. So if you have a decrease, decreased number of clotting factors, they're also trying to decrease the inhibitors of coagulation to restore that balance, which helps, you know, maintaining uh, hemostasis. So, over the head so the common tests that we perform in patients uh, with the suspected bleeding disorders include PT, PTT. We also frequently obtain what is called mixing studies. You know, if you have a prolonged PTT, for example, we can do like a one-to-one -one mixing uh, test. And if after the mixing study, the, um, uh, the PTT normalizes, that means there is something deficient in the, in the patient plasma, which is corrected by addition of normal plasma by one-to-one -one mix. So that indicates usually a factor deficiency. Um, but if the mixing study does not correct, then we think about an inhibitor to uh, the clotting process. And usually that kind of inhibitor is a lupus anticoagulant. So apart from blood counts, we also look at fibrinogen uh, levels. Thrombin time is a functional assay for fibrinogen. We also do a screening test called the PFA 100. That is also a, a common, uh, there are some uh, uh, caveats to the PFA 100. We have to have a, a, a hemoglobin that's greater than 10 and the platelet count should be over 100,000 to get accurate testing. And then we'll, we obtain frequently a von Willebrand a disease a diagnostic panel. So let's talk about uh, one case at a time and then we'll discuss in depth about individual conditions. So in the vignette one, we have a three-year-old child 
who was noticed at bath time to have several bruises on her back. The following morning, she had numerous tiny red spots on the trunk and abdomen. Examination revealed multiple petechiae on the skin and several on the soft palate, but she is otherwise normal. So um, on CBC, you find a white count of 5.8, hemoglobin of 12.9 with a hematocrit of 37, platelet count of 7,000, and uh, please assume that the differential count is normal here. PT, PTT, and INR are all normal. Uh, direct Coombs test was normal. All blood chemistries were normal. And IgG quantitative test was pending. So now we'll take a poll. Okay, so we'll have um, a, a poll question and I'll give you a few minutes to answer. What is the differential diagnosis you would consider here? Okay, now I think we'll conclude the poll. Let's see the results of the poll. So we had majority of the patient, 83% say it is ITP, and the other two uh, conditions mentioned were uh, ALL and non axonal trauma. Okay, that's, um, the majority is correct though. So the, the diagnosis we are considering here is ITP. So remember, uh, one of the clues why it is not non axonal trauma is there's also evidence of mucosal bleeding in this child. So now let us uh, go one by one. Why is it not ALL? So, um, you know, uh, here in this uh, CBC, we had isolated thrombocytopenia. We had a normal hemoglobin and we had a normal WBC count with a differential count. Now, Children's Oncology Group has done, you know, um, has kept records of large number of patients, um, and uh, they have found that isolated thrombocytopenia is almost never a presentation of ALL. Usually with ALL, there's more than one cytopenia. You have anemia with thrombocytopenia, low, low white blood cell count with thrombocytopenia, the differential count may show predominant lymphocytes. So, so you isolated thrombocytopenia in the absence of, an, for example, along with a normal physical exam, no, no lymphadenopathy or splenomegaly, we feel comfortable making a clinical diagnosis of ITP. Although, you know, we should be astute and still consider other conditions. So we had um, some other blood tests ordered uh, when the patient first presented in the emergency department. Next slide, please, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about ITP. So ITP, as you know, is a immune thrombocytopenic purpura. So um, the platelet destruction typically happens because there is platelet anti anti autoantibodies that coat the surface of the platelets. And these antibody coated platelets are cleared by the FC receptors on the macrophages in the spleen. So if you look at the, um, time, the age group in which ITP occurs, it usually occurs between two to five years of age uh, in children. And that is also the age group where acute lymphoblastic leukemia is most prevalent in pediatric age groups. So that, that's why a lot of people are usually concerned when they see significant thrombocytopenia and bruising that, you know, they always worry about possibility of ALL. Um, AL, uh, ITP can also occur in an older age uh, you know, and it is particularly uh, important to consider secondary forms of ITP now uh, in when a presentation is in the in in an older child. So what so when what is the difference between primary ITP and secondary ITP? Primary ITP is when ITP occurs in the absence of any systemic illness, but secondary ITP can occur whenever there's a systemic illness. For example, if you have uh, SLE or a common variable immunodeficiency or, you know, we don't see that commonly now, but HIV infection. Also, you know, uh, you can have uh, ITP, primary ITP present in, um, you know, young, young adolescent girls, and um, it, the likelihood of it developing into a chronic form of ITP or a persistent or chronic form of ITP is more in a, when the child is older, 
older um, presentation. So there's also other, uh, two other definitions you need to know. We use the term persistent ITP and chronic ITP. So acute ITP is when ITP is between uh, diagnosis to three months. If it is over three months to one year, it's persistent ITP. And if it's greater than one year, it's chronic ITP. And usually it's heralded by some kind of a viral infection and particularly in the younger children, either a respiratory or um, GI illness. It can occur after vaccinations, uh, sometimes after MMR vaccination. And um, severe bleeding is generally uncommon and intracranial hemorrhage is very rare. It's 0.1 to 0.5%. And touch wood, I have never seen a patient with ITP presenting with uh, intracranial hemorrhage. So like I said, um, you'll definitely ask his in the history, any history of fever, weight loss, bone pain, a night sweats, you know, these are all important questions. Uh, and also uh, look for other causes of secondary ITP. But the primary ITP patients is generally a well-looking child with no hepatosplenomegaly or lymphadenopathy. Um, so, and all the findings will be normal except for uh, the thrombocytopenia and uh, markedly decreased platelets in the peripheral smear. Uh, now, if you have a positive Coombs test in the direct Coombs test in the setting of um, ITP, we use the term Evans syndrome. And uh, sometimes, you know, we, we obtain the quantitative IgG levels because Common variable immunodeficiency often present with uh, autoimmune cytopenia. So sometimes that is uh, you know, also obtained upfront. Now, if you are suspecting a secondary uh, ITP, then we obtain other uh, studies, look for other autoimmune disorders, as well as if you exam, find splenomegaly on exam, you obtain an abdominal ultrasound. So there are some important points I want to stress in terms of uh, management of ITP. Next slide, please. Yeah. So um, like I said, uh, nearly 80% of the patients with uh, uh, ITP have the acute form of ITP and they resolve within uh, three months of presentation. Of that, nearly uh, half of those patients resolve within one month of presentation. Now, there are some important guidelines that came out from American Society of Hematology in 2019 and I want to discuss that um, briefly with you. So many times ITP is diagnosed with a child having um, minimal or no bleeding symptoms. So when that happens, this is important because you know pediatricians especially should know this because may, sometimes you may see this child in the office and then you have, um, the, um, you know, the patient has gone to the emergency department, for example, oftentimes you know, patients are sent home without any treatment because the recommendation is observation over treatment for no, if the patient doesn't have any bleeding symptoms or just some skin bruising. Now that is of course based upon uh, you know proximity. The patient lives very, very far away. Sometimes we admit the patient to the hospital, but again, the guidelines say admission is not necessary. Or if there is a parental anxiety, which sometimes also, um, we admit to, to give more education to the family about the natural course of ITP. So this is important to know that admission to the hospital is not automatic if you have a, a diagnosis of ITP with a platelet count of less than 20,000 and treatment is not automatic. So observation can still be done if patients have uh, mild to no bleeding symptoms. So if you are going to treat, the first line of treatment is corticosteroids. Again, I want you all pay attention to the new guidelines. So this is the current recommendations. If you're going to use steroids, they, they are recommending to use prednisone over dexamethasone. And if you're, you're going to use prednisone, it's going to be a short course. It should be completed within seven days. So the starting dose can vary between two to four milligrams. Some people typically start four milligram per kilo on the first day, three milligram per kilo on the second day, and then two milligram per kilo for the remaining five days. So corticosteroids are still the first line of treatment when compared to immunoglobulin or um, you know, anti-D, which is uh, Winro. You know, you're more familiar with Rogam, which is used in RH um, 
negative moms having a Rh positive baby. But in this case, we, the anti-D is called Vinro. Um, now, I did uh, mention some other options there, but they are not primarily used for um, acute ITP. Now, I did not mention the newer emerging new treatments for ITP, which are gaining grounds, uh, particularly what are called uh, TPORAs, th thrombopoietin receptor uh, agonists. And uh, there, there are two medicines you, I just want you to keep in mind. One is called L-thrombopag, and, and the other one is Romiplastim. So L-thrombopag is an oral medication, and Romiplastim is a IV medic is a sub-Q medication, excuse me. It's a subcutaneous medication. So uh, studies are underway for using uh, uh, thrombopoietin receptor agonists in the upfront setting for acute ITP. Uh, we also use adjunctive therapies like antifibrinolytics, like amino caprioic acid and tranexamic acid. So just a, a few other thrombocytopenia pearls I want to mention. You know, um, oftentimes uh, we get consulted from the NICU for neonatal thrombocytopenia. So the cause of neonatal thrombocytopenia is multifactorial. You know, many times we can't uh, have a good scientific um, exercise to precisely point out what is the cause of neonatal thrombocytopenia. It could be either due to sepsis, it could be perinatal asphyxia related. Uh, oftentimes these babies uh, have respiratory distress uh, and then um, they also have hyperbilirubinemia on phototherapy. And so, uh, and NEC of course is also a consideration. Now it's important to know when you have neonatal thrombocytopenia and if the platelet count was down on the first day of life, if you have uh, thrombocytopenia on day one of life, you have to give consideration to neonatal alloimmune thrombocytopenia. This is the RH counterpart of platelets. So just as you have an RH negative mom and an RH positive uh, baby, in this situation, you have a, a HP1A negative or, or the old name is PLA1 antigen. So HP1A negative mom and a HP1A positive baby. And in that situation, you can have, uh, you know, uh, uh, antibodies that cross the placenta and, uh, and um, from the mom and cause thrombocytopenia in the baby. Now, the difference between RH isoimmunization and neonatal alloimmune thrombocytopenia, RH isoimmunization usually affects subsequent pregnancies, but neonatal alloimmune thrombocytopenia can be seen even in the first pregnancy. And the way we do the workup, we send the, um, the testing on the parents. You know, we send it, uh, you know, if you can send, do, uh, look for the platelet antigens on the mom and the dad and look for uh, mismatch there, that is sufficient. We don't have to draw blood on the baby to make a diagnosis of neonatal alloimmune thrombocytopenia. We usually send it to Versity, which is, um, you know, the, one of the standardized places, uh, or pre formerly known as Blood Center of Wisconsin. That's uh, where we get uh, accurate uh, testing for uh, our patients. The other one is a Casabac Merritt syndrome. Uh, you know, especially if patients have got large hemangioma lesions, there can be platelet trapping and consumption. So you can see, for example, low fibrinogen with thrombocytopenia along with D-dimer elevation. But, uh, you know, you may want to consider if you have uh, a situation like that, looking for, uh, you know, large hemangiomas, you know, by obtaining an ultrasound. So the other uh, examples I've briefly mentioned, you have the classic TAR syndrome with uh, thrombocytopenia and absent radii. You know, um, so usually this is a quantitative defect and uh, thrombocytopenia improves with time. There's also Viscot Aldrich syndrome with a defect in vas protein. Here you have thrombocytopenia with, and small platelets uh, often associated with eczema and immune deficiency. And here there is both uh, quantitative and qualitative platelet abnormalities. Bernard Sulier is basically uh, the, the absence of the glycoprotein 1B, 9B receptor. You know, that's where the one membrane factor binds to the subendothelial collagen. And in this patient, you have thrombocytopenia with large defective platelets. Both, it's both a quantitative and a qualitative defect. And then you have Glanzmann's thrombosthenia, where there's absence of uh, the GP 
the glycoprotein 2B3 A receptor, that's the fibrinogen binding receptor. In, this, in these patients, usually the platelet count is normal. However, so if you do a platelet function, you'll find that uh, all the platelet curves for collagen, epinephrine, and uh, ADP are all abnormal except for restocytin induced clonelet platelet aggregation. So uh, this is a very classic for glanceman thrombocytemia. Next one, please. So we'll talk about a patient uh, with a 17-year-old adolescent girl who's brought to the emergency department for increasing fatigue and pallor. Uh, for the last year, she's had increasingly heavy menstrual cycles. Her latest cycles have been uh, ongoing for the last eight days. She has not had any obvious clots, but she had, she's had to use double pads throughout the day. She reports that she has never been sexually active. Her medical history is otherwise unremarkable with no other bleeding symptoms. Her physical exam is normal. The patient's mother reports that she had a similar history of heavy menstrual bleeding. She also needed a packed red blood cell transfusion after childbirth. So this is the lab finding. So hemoglobin is 6.9, MCV is 68, Platelet count is normal at 290. Prothrombin time is 13 seconds, normal. PTT is 34 seconds, close to the upper end of normal. Blood type is A positive. Uh, the urine pregnancy test is negative. The von Willebrand antigen level is 34% and von Willebrand factor activity is 36%. So let us take a poll again. So uh, the questions here are, of the following, the most likely cause of this patient's heavy menstrual bleeding is a deficiency of factor in common coagulation pathway, factor in extrinsic coagulation pathway, factor in intrinsic coagulation pathway, protein involved in platelet adhesion to collagen, none of the above. So this is this question is based on you know the hemostasis, hemostasis discussion I had earlier with you guys. So just uh, uh, you know hopefully. You can answer this based on that. So let's give a few minutes. Okay, now we can take a poll, see. So 44% um, said common coagulation pathway, 22% said intrinsic pathway, 22% said uh, protein involved in platelet addition to collagen. So the correct answer is um, protein involved in platelet addition to collagen, because that is uh, here we are thinking about one Willebrand factor, and that's the one which is responsible for the addition of platelets to the subendothelial collagen. So, next slide, please. So this patient has. What is, what is called von Willebrand disease. It's the most common bleeding disorder. Next slide, please. We're trying. Next slide. So von Willebrand disease is um, the most common bleeding disorder. It is autosomal dominant inheritance. Um, now, it is estimated there are about 1% of uh, patients you know, affected with von Willebrand disease. It equally affects both males and females. However, females tend to have more bleeding symptoms related to their menstrual bleeding and postpartum hemorrhage. Now, we can have mucocutaneous symptoms like epistaxis, and the frequency and the severity of the bleeding is highly variable. So, uh, like I mentioned earlier, it facilitates platelet addition to the damaged subendothelium by binding to the glycoprotein 1B9 receptor. It also assists with platelet aggregation. And it also carries packed rate and protects it from degradation by protein C. So this is like a pictorial uh, representation. In the top uh, of the picture, you see, you know, where the everything is intact. You know how the von Miller brand is in, exists in the form of multimers. But when there is an injury, the von Miller brand factor adheres to the sub. Uh, to the vessel subendothelial matrix. And then with shear, these multimers uncoil 
there is platelet activation and increased platelet um, adherence and then ultimately uh, this leads to exposure exposition of the phosphatidyl serine and then the cell based coagulation is uh, begins and ultimately leading to formation of a platelet fibrin plug sealing the vascular injury and followed by thrombolysis and tissue repair so just some uh, points about von Willebrand disease. As I, as I mentioned, mucocutaneous bleeding uh, in the form of epistaxis or menorrhagia um, uh, can happen. Um, now, sometimes you know, patients can have significant reduction in factor eight levels and they can have some deep bleeds and hemarthrosis, but they're very rare. But I want to emphasize one point. In the, in the patient's case, we saw that the factor levels for one well brand factor levels were greater than 30%. Oftentimes, the, the teaching used to be to make a diagnosis of one well brand disease, you want to have one, one well brand factor activity of less than 30%. But in the new guidelines, even if you have uh, VWF activity between 30 to 50%, but patient has got bleeding symptoms, either nosebleeds or menorrhagia, for example, that is still considered as type one von Willebrand disease. Now, I just mentioned a term called type one von Willebrand disease that is, indic is indicative of a mild deficiency on von Willebrand factor. Now, if you have absent von Willebrand factor, that is considered type three. That's also extremely rare. Now, but you can also have functional abnormalities in von Willebrand factor, and uh, those are different. Uh, types of what we call type 2 von Willebrand disease. So under type 2, you have type 2A, type 2B, type 2M, type 2N, and also platelet type of von Willebrand disease. Those are rare, so I'm not going to discuss that in detail right now, but uh, just uh, be aware of other types. They, those are qualitative defects when you have type 2, as opposed to quantitative defect, which is in type 1 and type 3. Patients who are blood type O tend to have lower levels of one brand factor levels. And also uh, one brand factor levels go up during pregnancy. So bleeding is uncommon during pregnancy, but after childbirth, when the estrogen levels dramatically decline, they tend to have postpartum bleeding. So that's a classic presentation of uh, one brand disease. And um, also, when you are when patients are on estrogen-containing uh, oral contraceptive pills, you will see elevated von Willebrand levels, and that's how patients uh, get relief from bleeding symptoms. Now, if you have to do any levels in patients on oral contraceptive pills, it is recommended to do it during that period when they're having the menstrual cycle, not during a time when they're not having the menstrual flow. Also, keep in mind, you no, know, oftentimes. Um, when we have um, a, a, a trauma or, or, or for example, a non-accidental trauma with significant, um, you know, a bleed, uh, an intracranial bleed. At that time, uh, when we get one Willebrand factor levels, they will be increased because it's an acute phase reactant. So any stress, injury, inflammation, uh, sometimes even recent exercise can also lead to increased one Willebrand factor levels. So if you uh, get normal, one, one millibrand diagnostic evaluation when you're assessing a patient in the inpatient setting, for example, due to inter intracranial bleed, you're not sure if it's non accidental trauma or not. Even if the levels come back normal at that time, it's very important to repeat the levels in about six weeks to three months because, in steady state, you want to document that the one millibrand levels are indeed normal. In uh, some patients with hypothyroidism also have low von Willebrand levels that could explain some of their menorrhagia symptoms. The treatment of uh, von Willebrand disease includes, uh, you know, a DDAVP or desmopressin. Uh, so what we often do is uh, we, um, there is a, a form of desmopressin called stymate, which is different from the one we use for, uh, for example, patient with enuresis. So in this, in this time, it is specific for uh, patients with uh, von Willebrand disease. And we often do what is called a, a desmopressin challenge for the patient. So we obtain levels uh, of um, von Willebrand factor and factor eight levels pre um, um, you know, desmopressin, which is given as a nasal spray. 
And we also do about one hour post to look for response from desmopressin, one to two hour post. And uh, if, if the patient is a responder, you will see high levels of uh, von Neubrandt factor and um, factor eight levels post um, uh, nasal spray treatment. Um, now, but now that there is, unfortunately, there's a national back order for, uh, for stymate, and it's not expected to be available till um, end of 2022. So, so many of our patients, uh, if we have to do a challenge, we can also do IV, that's IV DDADP and, uh, and, and obtain the levels in the same way. Uh, so, and once you have a patient who is uh, responsive to desmopressin, that can be used as a preoperative treatment if patient is undergoing certain procedures. Now, there are other von Willebrand containing products. One is um, Fumate P, which is mentioned. There are other types, uh, Alphanate or Vilate. Uh, they have a um, mixture of both von Willebrand factor and factor eight, but there's also a um, um, recombinant pure von Willebrand factor, and that's called von Wendy. Now, uh, just a, a caution when you are using these products um, as in the preoperative setting, either before, say, wisdom teeth extraction or tonsillectomy. So you can use uh, Humate P or uh, Alphanate, which are plasma-derived uh, von Willebrand-containing uh, products, uh, you know, within, say, one hour before surgery and have a successful procedure and... Uh, and almost with minimal, with no bleeding symptoms. Uh, but when you use one Wendy, because it's a pure one milligram factor, it has to bind to factor eight. So it's important to remember that you have to give it at least six hours before the procedure. So six to eight hours. So one could, if it's an early morning procedure, one could probably do it late night, um, you know, or you, it's important that uh, we, we keep this in mind that if the surgery is going to happen in the afternoon, that uh, the patient gets the one Wendy early in the morning before the procedure. Then we also use adjunctive therapies um, like antifibrinolytics, tranexamic acid, and aminocaproic acid, uh, and also mentioned about uh, oral contraception. You know. Um, next. So in Vineyard 3, we have a full-term male delivered at home who presents with oozing from the umbilical stump at two weeks of life. So the most likely diagnosis is hemorrhagic disease of the newborn. So let us talk a little bit about a vitamin K deficiency, which is the cause of hemorrhagic disease of the newborn. So as you know that in the newborn, there is one immaturity of the liver there's poor placental transfer of vitamin K from the mother to the baby. Uh, and also uh, whenever baby is uh, breastfed, for example, there is very low uh, content of vitamin K in breast milk. And also uh, infants uh, tend to have a sterile gut. Most of the colonic bacteria, which are responsible for making vitamin K, you know, they have a sterile gut. So they don't have the uh, advantage of making vitamin K. So uh, this is what vitamin K actually does. You know, you have the vitamin K epoxide, which is the inactive form with vitamin K epoxide deductase, which converts it into the active form. And it's the active form which helps in the activation of uh, clotting factors. So the vitamin K dependent factors are two, seven, nine, and 10, as well as some of the inhibitors of coagulations, which are protein C and protein S. So the medicine warfarin, which is used uh, in patients who are uh, having hypercoagulable states, that targets the vitamin K epoxide reductase. That's how you are able to achieve therapeutic response to warfarin. Right, please. So as I mentioned, um, you know, breastfed infants who um, have, have um, are likely to have vitamin K deficiency, and especially if they did not receive the uh, intramuscular vitamin K for either uh, parental anxiety. There was one uh, publication that came out uh, from UK, this was in the 80s, where they followed some uh, uh, baby who's, who had uh, received vitamin K. And for, for some inexplicable reason, there was a higher incidence of ALL in the babies who received vitamin K compared to those who did not. 
but subsequent studies have all shown that is not the case. But still, uh, there is some old literature based on which some families are, are very anxious about uh, you know, using vitamin K uh, after birth. So there are some families who may refuse that. Uh, now, the classic uh, types of vitamin K deficiency are the early, and then you have the classical and the late. The early vitamin K deficiency you know, uh, typically occurs in patients, for example, who are on uh, moms or on medications such as anticonvulsants that block the vitamin K activity. So these patients can present with a large cephal hematoma or they can have you know, bleeding from either GI bleeding or other forms of mucosal bleeding. And um, sometimes you know, up to 25% of the patients can have intracranial bleed as well. The classic vitamin K deficiency occurs between one to seven uh, days of age. This is, as I said, in um, infants who have not received uh, IM vitamin K shot. And uh, so they also typically have, uh, you know, GI, either skin bleeds or uh, bleeding from the umbilical site or um, site of circumcision or GI bleeding. Late onset occurs between, um, uh, you know, day eight to six months and uh, Usually it's a secondary to some form of malabsorption, fat mal malabsorption, and can be seen in like, for example, patients who have biliary atresia or cystic fibrosis patients. So treatment is to give vitamin K. So next we have a, a 15 month old patient who presents to the ED with warm swollen knee and mom um, reports that she's adopted and does not know her biological family history. Mom also reports uh, that she's been having menorrhagia. Initial lab evaluation shows PT is normal, PTT is prolonged, but it corrects with mixing studies. Remember what I told you earlier, that if, for example, the PTT corrects with mixing studies, then we have to suspect a factor deficiency. So in this, it's important um, to remember that um, uh, you know, patients, uh, in this, we are thinking about clotting factor deficiency. Oftentimes, uh, uh, there is bleeding after circumcision. Very rarely, we can see some first time where a hemophilia is diagnosed after a, a surgical procedure such as a tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy. There is one particular form of factor IX Leiden, which has got a late teenage presentation, but majority of the patients are diagnosed you know, in, in early childhood. Uh, so, you know, after birth, children can have cephal hematomas, which are fairly large. Sometimes you worry about intracranial hemorrhage. Uh, and in the first year of life, and especially in the child, after nine months, the child is learning to walk, there can be increased bruising and uh, there can be development of hematomas after vaccination. And uh, you also typically get uh, history of uh, male maternal relatives, you know, with uh, bleeding disorders. So remember one third of patients with hemophilias may not have any family history, but oftentimes we are uh, notified ahead of time, you know, the, when, the, um, when the baby is going to be delivered, they, they let the hematologists know that there is a mom with a family history of hemophilia, baby is being delivered. One of the things that is recommended at the time of delivery is uh, before the onset of labor, if the patient, one can consider elective C-section. You know, it should be, it's important to do it before the onset of labor. Now, um, if you are going to do a vaginal delivery, it's important not to use forceps or vacuum extractions because that can increase risk of uh, bleeding complications. So those two things you have to keep in mind. And, uh, you know, uh, the history of intracranial bleeding anyway is, uh, um, is seen even in children who are hemostatically intact uh, otherwise, but in babies uh, with hemophilia, there is a higher incidence of intracranial bleeding. Um, but um, typically we don't start any treatment, uh, you know, um, till the baby has the first major bleed. I'll talk about the treatment and what is happening uh, in the landscape of hemophilia in the next slides. So just briefly, you know, we have a factor eight deficiency, which is hemophilia A and factor nine deficiency is hemophilia B. A is more common than B. Uh, a occurs in one in 5,000, B in one in 30,000. Uh, nearly um, two thirds of all hemophilia A patients are severe. Uh, 
about half of all hemophilia B patients are severe. They affect all ethnicities and uh, racial groups. Like I said, males are affected. Females are usually carriers unless there is evidence of X inactivation or in the rare situation where there is a, uh, a father with hemophilia and a mother is also a hemophilia carrier for the, and uh, that, can, uh, that can lead to uh, females being affected. But even carrier females, as I had in my vignette, can have heavy menstrual bleeding. So you have to keep that in mind uh, as, as a, that a, in the workup of menorrhagia, we should consider a uh, possibility of a carrier with hemophilia also as a cause of, hemo, hemo, cause of hemo, uh, menorrhagia. So, uh, you know, we classify hemophilia into mild, moderate, and severe. If you're less than 1%, you are severe. If you're one to five, you're moderate. And if you're greater than five to less than 40%, you are mild. So the symptoms are dependent on the severity of factor levels. So uh, patients who are severe tend to bleed more often and less so with moderate and uncommon bleeding with mild patients. Some of the mild hemophilias may go undetected until uh, you know, uh, later on in childhood uh, when they have a surgical procedure, like I mentioned. But the moderate and severe patients are usually diagnosed early, particularly uh, if there is no family history, you know, post-circumcisional bleeding, uh, you know, can be a, a, an indicator of possible hemophilia. So the treatment for hemophilia, uh, traditionally, um, you know, what we have, there are two aspects to it. One is prophylactic and on-demand treatment. So on-demand means whenever there is a, a joint bleed or a, a, a big skeletal um, muscle bleed, we give factor at that time. But however, people have uh, lots of studies now which showed that prophylaxis, uh, factor prophylaxis. So for factor eight, traditionally we were doing like three times a week prophylaxis. For factor nine, we were doing like one to two times a week prophylaxis. Uh, you know, it clearly led to better joint health. And because they did MRI studies in patients who were given on-demand bleeding versus those who were maintained on prophylaxis, their uh, joint abnormalities were markedly worse than those who were on on-demand uh, treatment as opposed to those who got prophylactic treatment. So prophylaxis became the mainstay of treatment for patients with moderate to severe hemophilia. Mild hemophilia patients were still treated on an on-demand basis. A lot of advances have taken place in hemophilia in the last decade. So we went from standard half-life products. That means factor eight has got a half-life of about eight hours to in factor nine about um, you know, 12 to 16 hours. So we went from a normal half-life products to what are called extended half-life products. And now we are also in the era of non-factor therapies. So Traditionally, uh, we already talked about this. So, uh, so uh, briefly, you know, the type of bleeds we see in hemophilia, apart from hemarthrosis, we have deep muscle hematoma, we have iliopsoas hemorrhage. We can get a big compartment syndrome sometimes after an, a major injury. Uh, intracranial bleed, if you worry about that, you know, GI bleeding, and also. It's very important, right, uh, when hemophilia patients undergo any kind of uh, teeth extraction, if they need local anesthesia, it's important that we give them factor prior to the procedure because sometimes when they do the local anesthesia, you know, that can lead to, you know, significant bleeding and lead to airway obstruction also. You have to be careful. So it's always uh, advised that um, there's coordination of care with our clinic when they undergo procedures. So, um, this is, this is sometimes uh, the traditional way when we are using the standard half-life products that I mentioned. So to remember that factor eight, uh, one unit per uh, kg replaces factor act, uh, increases factor eight activity by 2%, but factor nine, it's uh, one to one. But there are uh, uh, now advancements in treatment wherein we have now what are called extended half-life products, which have a, a little bit of a different um, ratio in terms of um, uh, factor administered and the activity that we get. So we were able to extend the half-life of factor eight from um, eight to maximum 12 to 14 hours. But for factor nine, we have been very successful in extending a half-life to as high as 60 hours now. So there are patients, believe it or not, with, uh, with hemophilia B or factor nine deficiency, 
instead of getting prophylaxis weekly, can now go every two weeks, uh, you know, by prophylaxis by with factor nine. But the real advancement has taken place in uh, factor eight um, treatment. Now we are up to in the era of what are called non-factor therapies. And uh, one of the non-factor therapies I want you to keep in mind is, um, next slide please, um, is, is a medicine called, um, uh, next slide please, a medicine called, uh, next slide, uh, emisuzumab. So emisuzumab is basically a biphasic antibody. So it does the exact same job as factor eight. It binds to factor 9A and factor 10, like I said earlier in my discussion, and, and it, it promotes the clotting cascade. So because it's an antibody, it can be administered, uh, it doesn't have to be administered as often. They have a, antibodies have a much longer half-life. So, and it can also be administered subcutaneously instead of intravenously. So emisuzumab has really revolutionized uh, hemophilia 8 management. So now we are giving subcutaneous um, emisuzumab, uh, depending on the vial size, some patient gets it weekly, some patient get it every two weekly, and a small number of patients even go every four weeks, you know, for treatment of uh, emisuzumab. It's just like giving an insulin shot, you know, much less frequently. And the advantage of using emisuzumab Previously, remember I told you we started factor eight prophylaxis after the first joint bleed or a muscle bleed in, uh, in a severe uh, factor eight deficiency or a moderate factor eight deficiency. Now we can start it soon after birth. So the recommendations uh, for many organizations is emisuzumab as soon as the diagnosis of factor eight is made, the moderate or severe factor eight deficiency, emisuzumab can be started soon after birth. Uh, there has not been um, um, uh, enough clinical data to support the use of emisuzumab in patients with mild hemophilia, partly because you know the equivalent factor eight activity with emisuzumab is roughly about um, you know approximately twenty percent or so. So if a patient with uh, mild hemophilia is already having twenty percent factor activity, you don't get um, benefit of having emisuzumab plus factor eight. It, it's not additive. You know, the fat rate is much more, uh, it's a competitive inhibition. So from the binding sites, fat rate can displace the emisuzumab, and, um, but um, it, it doesn't sort of make you hypercoagulable. They don't, they're not additive. And, it's, and for the same reason, it's also not very effective in patients with uh, mild hemophilia A. So I think we're almost close to uh, one o'clock. I think I want to take a break here. Uh, you know, let's do some question and answer session. And I'm sorry that I had to go quickly for the last couple of slides, but um, let's have some open discussion. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Raj. Um, one question is, uh, uh, so with ITP, are you only looking at the clinical picture and not checking platelets counts during their um, ITP? No, we, uh, the clinical picture is for the initial determination, observation versus treatment but we follow the platelet counts, you know, at least uh, uh, initially twice a week maybe, and then weekly. Okay. And then another question on direct oral anticoagulants. When will they be uh, available for pediatric population? Already the studies are underway. We are uh, starting to in use it more and more, especially in our um, uh, you know, uh, adolescent patients. And um, there are... Uh, no, there are, for DOACs, as they're called, it's, it's important to remain, remember the contraindications. We cannot use it in patients who are what are called triple positive. That means lupus anticoagulant with anti-cardiolipin antibodies and anti-glycoprotein-1 antibodies, because these patients have very high levels of lupus anticoagulant, and uh, they have been found to be inferior to Coumadin in clinical trials. You cannot use DOVAX in patients with heart valves, mechanical heart valves you cannot use because still the, um, you know, Comedin is superior to DOVAX. And uh, there is also a new, some emerging data with cancer associated thrombosis that uh, Comedin is superior to DOVAX. But there is a lot of pediatric experience and very soon we'll be using it widely, you know. In okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Raj. And a reminder to everyone, you will receive